All right, here we are, Hebrews, the glorious Jesus. This is lesson number 14, the last one in the series. Title of this particular lesson, The Glory of the Church of Christ. Uh, and the Church of Christ is Holy Part 2. And uh, we'll be uh, covering uh, chapter number 13 in the book of Hebrews. So let's do uh, one final review, shall we? Uh, after showing how Jesus glorifies His church through His life and death and resurrection and accession, uh, ascension to the right hand of God, the uh, author goes on to uh, encourage the, his readers on how the church of the glorious Jesus glorifies Him. So Jesus glorifies His church with His life, death, resurrection, you know, His ministry. The church glorifies Jesus, he says, in the following way. They glorify Jesus by remaining faithful despite the many trials that they face as Christians and also by living holy lives in this, in this world. Now this holy lifestyle is what we talked about last. This holy lifestyle the author began to describe in more practical terms in chapter number 12. And this holy lifestyle, according to the author, required the church to do the following. Uh, first of all, encourage those among them who were weak, weak in faith, weak in spirit, for one reason or another. Uh, this holy lifestyle also uh, required them to avoid conflict and immorality and a bad example that would lead to the loss of faith, especially for another person. And then this holy lifestyle would also see them become grateful for the secure position that they had as Christians, uh, especially Christians who will survive the destruction of the world that will occur when Jesus returns. The author said in our last lesson that when Jesus returns, he's going to shake the world in a sense that nothing that he has not established will survive. Well, the thing that he's established, of course, is the church. So the author ends his last chapter by reminding his readers that God has always punished those who disobeyed him, and so they, even though they are in Christ, should be careful to heed his warning, meaning heed uh, the writer of this epistle's warning. So in the last chapter, now that we enter into chapter 13, this last chapter, the author continues to list the things that witness a holy church. Uh, to the previous exhortation to you know, encourage others, to avoid conflict and uh, immoralities and bad examples, and also to be grateful, he adds the following exhortations. So a holy church, he says, loves the brethren, loves the brethren. So let's read chapter 13, verses one to three. He says, let love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them, and those who are ill-treated, since you yourselves also are in the body. So not that it should begin, but that this love of the brethren, he says, it should continue to be a common feature of their lifestyle. Hospitality is one way to show this love of the brethren from the Greek word xenos philios, meaning the love of strangers, the love of other Christians, even though they may be strangers to you. In the first century, you know, many, many Christians uh, traveled. You know, pre the, the idea of a located preacher, you know, a preacher stayed just with one church, was not yet developed at that time. So uh, you had traveling Bible teachers, traveling preachers, and hosting them in your home was an important part, not only of hospitality, but also an important part of evangelism and, and, and teaching of the church. You know, some people could host these teachers while they uh, did their work in the church. And he talks about the many benefits from hospitality, he mentions Abraham, you know, entertaining angels, uh, unawares. Uh, hospitality, not just having somebody in your house, not just that limited idea of hospitality, but hospitality is kindness to others that you, um, you're not necessarily familiar with, people who are not known to you. For example, uh, those who suffer, you know, uh, an individual do something, do something wrong, make a mistake, make a poor choice, give in to temptation, 
and they are caught for their crime and they go to jail. Well, you know what? They're still human beings. They're still individuals who have families and feelings and hopes and dreams and so on and so forth and now their life has been you know, kind of redirected, if you wish, and they're sitting in jail for uh, six months, two years, whatever it is to, you know, as they say, pay their debt to society. Uh, hospitality doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean having them in your home, but certainly reaching out to them. That's what prison ministry is all about, loving those okay, that we do not know, especially those who are in a difficult, um, difficult situation. Uh, because they're suffering just like human beings suffer, because they are human beings. So this is within Christian context, how we should treat others within the church. Okay? Uh, he goes on to say uh, a holy lifestyle also includes sexual purity. Verse four, he says, marriage is to be held in honor among all and the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers God will, joy, uh, God will judge. So here we have a kind of a general exhortation to marital fidelity and sexual purity uh, for those who are, uh, see themselves as single, who find themselves as single people. Author is saying that God honors the intimacy enjoyed within marriage. You know, we should honor you know, the ma marriages to be honored among all. Uh, there was a, a movement at that time you know, seeking to establish the idea that perhaps if you didn't marry you were better, you know, holier than others, but you know, the author is saying you know, marriage, marriage is a holy thing and it should be honored by everyone. It shouldn't be disparaged. It's not a second choice type thing. It's a godly thing. God, that, God designed that for men and we should honor it. And of course there's the, there's the warning. Yes, as much as we are allowed uh, freedom in our intimacy, in our sexual intimacy within marriage, to the degree that we are free to express that within our marriage, uh, we are limited if we are not married. Uh, we need to practice sexual purity. And, and the author is saying here, holiness among Christians requires that everyone honor marriage, especially those who are within marriage, and those who are not married, they, they know how to uh, control themselves uh, because God will punish sexual impurity. Holiness, he continues, uh, also is seen and practiced in uh, contentment. Contentment of character, this is a, a holy thing. Uh, we read in verse five, he says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I forsake you. Uh, so that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. And so he establishes the goal and attitude for a Christian in relationship to wealth. Uh, we should be free from the love of money, not free from wealth, free from the inordinate love and desire for wealth or money. Uh, love of money causes a person to function always in relationship to the acquiring of money or to the acquiring of things. You know, uh, anything that comes up in life for someone who loves money always has the calculation, how much will this cost me and do I want to spend that? Um, people like this are always afraid that they won't have enough that if they don't acquire money, uh, they'll be destitute. Uh, it's often said, you know, people who grew up very, very poor, they have this attitude about money. You know? Money becomes very important to them and they use this as an excuse for their, you know, uh, their uh, mistaken uh, attitude about money. You know, the way to correct this, of course, is, is through, through faith. And so the author encourages them to seek to be content or satisfied. Word means to be filled up, to be unafraid. You know, he says, don't be afraid. Learn to be content. Learn to be satisfied with what you have. It doesn't mean you can't change what you have, but while you have it, you need to learn to be content with what you have. The author encourages them to seek to be content or satisfied, filled up, unafraid, with what they presently have. Satisfaction you know, is not based on the amount of what we have, but rather on the assurance that God gives to His people. And what is that assurance? 
Well, that he will never abandon his own and that he will always be there to help and defend his people. He'll provide for them. He is, as a brother Dayton says, he is sufficient for all matters and all situations. And so satisfaction, you know, uh, again, not based on what you have, but based on what God has promised us. That's how we find contentment and satisfaction. So their confidence that they will have all that they need should be based on God's promise to care for them and not on their ability to acquire money. Again, the ability to acquire and make and multiply money, that's a gift, that's a skill. The writer is saying, don't depend on that skill to cultivate uh, the virtue of contentment in your heart. Contentment in your heart, satisfaction in your heart, God does this for you based on the promises that He's made and the strength of your faith in those promises. Um, then he uh, switches gears, uh, beginning in uh, verse uh, 7 to 16, and he does a warning. He makes a warning against strange doctrines. So a holy church will keep faithfully the teachings of Christ. You know, a holy church will love the brethren, you know, and so on and so forth. Hospitality, love, not too much of the, uh, you know, the love of money. And a holy church will also keep faithfully the teachings of Christ. So this passage that we're going to read now is like a, is like a sandwich. The top layer exhorts the, the people in the church to heed past teachers. The middle layer refers to the various doctrinal issues that they face at the present time. And then the bottom layer exhorts them to heed their present teachers, so like a sandwich. Pay, to, pay attention to the past teachers, focus you know, what you need to be focusing on in all the teachings that you're receiving at the moment, and then pay attention to your current teachers. Okay. So let's, let's kind of break that down. So uh, he says, remember those who taught you uh, in the past, who taught you the faith, in verse, uh, in verse uh, seven. He says, remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. So first layer, you know, teachers who used to teach them. They need to remember their original teachers and the teachings that brought them to Christ in the first place. These people were obviously gone now, but these brethren are encouraged to imitate the faithful lifestyle, their faithful lifestyle, in order to gain their similar end, which was finishing life as a faithful disciple of Christ. Their former teachers, they were faithful. They lived holy lives, right? They taught them what they needed to do and say and think and learn. And so the author is saying, consider these teachers and imitate them. And if you imitate them, you're going to end up like them. And how did they end up? Well, they finished their lives as faithful Christians. And that's what we're trying to do. That's what he was encouraging them to do. Okay, so then he says, okay, now we're going to look at the middle layer. Consider their teaching, he says, versus the false doctrine which is swirling around you at the moment. So, verse eight. He says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So he establishes that the first thing they were taught, the glory and the supremacy of Christ, this first thing that they were taught is as true now as it was then and will always be true. That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. That was true when we taught you long ago, he says. It's true now and it'll be true in the future. Circumstances change, doctrines, you know, different doctrines come and go, but Jesus, he says, always remains. So the author has reviewed how Jesus and His ministry was superior to every, uh, every concept and every, uh, 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 every aspect, if you wish, of the Jewish religion. That's what this whole epistle is about. Now he makes one final argument showing how Christian worship of God offered by disciples of Jesus is superior to that offered by the people still trying to worship God through Judaism. So he kind of reaches back to what he's been doing in the past, 
showing how Jesus is superior to you know, the angels, to Moses, to the sacrificial system, to the priest, to the you know, Jesus is superior to all these things. He's been demonstrating that for like 12 chapters and he, he, he takes one more shot at it. One more, one more time he's going to get across this idea, the superiority, the glory of Jesus. And this time he says that Jesus is greater than the worship, if you wish. Worship of Jesus is greater than the worship that was being offered in the temple. Now, one accusation against the Christian religion at the time and their worship was that there was no sacrifice. There was no way for the individual to participate in the offering of something tangible to God, because in the Old Testament system, you know, there were animals, there was, there was flour, and there was oil, and you know, there were offerings of you know, thousands of animals, that, that offering, and, and the worshiper came, and because of the priest, the intermediation of the priest, that person was part of that sacrifice. They were doing something. And so the accusation is, well, you people, you sit around and pray you know, and sing, but I mean, you don't have that central thing in your, in, your, in your worship. So the author is going to argue that Christians do have a sacrifice and they do have a worship very much acceptable to God. So now we can read verse 9a. He says, do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings. So he begins with a general warning not to be swept away by false teaching and he refers to the many false teachings that centered on food at that time. Some doctrines restricted certain foods and other doctrines held up consumption as some kind of worship. The idea was that all doctrines concerning food proposed the notion that the abstinence from or the indulging in food in some way made you more or less acceptable and pleasing to God. If you ate this type of food, you were not as acceptable to God as if you, uh, you know, restricted yourself from eating that food. Uh, but on the other hand, these other foods, if you ate those foods, well, oh yeah, there, there, you were, you were pleasing to God. So food you know, was an important element, if you wish, uh, in, uh, in the Jewish religion and certainly in some of the other religions that, um, that existed at the time. So the idea was that all doctrines concerning food proposed the notion that the abstinence from or the indulging in food in some way, as I said, made you more or less acceptable to God. So the author reminds them that food's purpose is to strengthen the body, not to strengthen the heart or the soul of man. To strengthen the soul, one needed the grace of God not food laws, and Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 14, 17, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. I'm not going to go there because I want us to stay focused on this passage here. So let's read the next verse. So, do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. So there's a bridge here to his main thought. There were many, he says, who were overly concerned about food issues and it didn't benefit them. Now he's going to mention specific ones to whom food was very important and that was, of course, the Jews at that time. The specific food he targets is the meat of the sacrifice offered by and eaten by the priests. Um, the very temple of the uh, sacrifice that Christians uh, were accused of not having and thus uh, pursuing a worship that had no real, um, uh, you know, no real uh, substance. And so the, 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 the author is answering a, a, you know, a, a, a rhetorical question. You know, some people might say or some people are saying, well, your worship is not really a legitimate worship because there's no sacrifice, which was the central element of the Jewish worship. And the author is saying, no, 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 Christian worship is superior to uh, Jewish worship because we have a sacrifice. And he goes on to explain the type of sacrifice being offered in uh, Christian worship. So let's read uh, verse 10. He says, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. 
So the author here claims that Christians, they have an altar or a sacrifice. He, he uses the word altar as a representative for the entire process of the sacrificial offering uh, that the Jews were active in at the time. You know, a substitute word, we do that too in English. You know, we use the word business, for example, for all that goes on in the selling and the repairing of uh, uh, televisions. Okay? So we'll say to the guy, well, how's business, right? And what do we mean by business? Well, we mean you know, everything that's going on, the repair work, the selling, the delivery, you know, the store, the profit, the customers, all that stuff. You know, we're saying, how's business? It's a device we use. It's called metonymy, where we use one word to replace another, or one word to represent a group of things. And so the author is saying, we have you know, an altar. That altar there is representing everything that the, uh, that the Jews do in their sacrificial system. And he's saying, well, we have a sacrificial system. You know, we have an altar as well. Interesting, he also claims that Christians share a sacrifice that the priests have no right even to share. At least in the Jewish sacrifice, you know, the, the, the people could share in it. Well, he's saying, you know what, in the Christian sacrifice, even the priests in the Jewish religion, they have no right to share in it. And it's interesting to note that he refers to them, you know, the priests, as the servants of the tent, the tent or the tabernacle, right? The service of the tabernacle and not the servants of God. Since God is no longer in the earthly temple, they now only serve the building and not God. Yes, there was a time when God said, my presence is there, that's how you know I'm among you. But, but God is no longer there. You know, the, the, the curtain is torn in two, people can go in. God is in heaven, Jesus has gone to heaven to make the, 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 the sacrifice in order to atone for our sins. And so he's saying, you people, yeah, you have a system of offering and you're serving the temple, but that's all you're serving. You're just going through the motions in the temple, but God isn't there. God is in heaven. And we serve the altar of the God who is in heaven. So let's go to verse 11. He says, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. So here he refers to the practice of the high priests on the Day of Atonement who would, for only this time, they would not eat any part of the sacrifice. The law said that they had to, you know, they had to eat part of the sacrifice, right? But this time, the Day of Atonement, they didn't eat any part of the sacrifice, but rather they would take the entire sacrifice outside the camp and totally destroy it by fire. It was to be wholly offered to God in this way and then the ashes from that would be mixed with water and would be used in purification rites with the people when they, had been, uh, when they became unclean, ceremoniously unclean for a variety of reasons. So these animals were sacrificed and by totally removing them from the camp, the significance was that the sins which they bore were also removed from the camp. Okay, so that's the idea that he's beginning to uh, allude to in verse 11. So stay with me here, verse 12. He says, therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So he makes a parallel with Jesus' sacrifice saying that this practice, you know, in the Old Testament, you know, a whole sacrifice burned outside the camp, transferring the sins and taking them outside the camp onto the animal, right? He says this thing here is typified, is the type for Jesus' ultimate sacrifice. He suffered and He died outside the camp, outside the city, since Calvary was um, uh, outside the city of, of Jerusalem. And His blood and His sacrifice purified the people from sin, okay? Verse 13 and 14, so he says, summarizing, let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. So just as the people went 
to the priests to be purified by the ashes of the sacrifice of atonement, he says, let us, Christians, let us go to Jesus for our purification. He is our sacrifice, He is our altar, and uh, 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 because of uh, their disbelief, the priests had no right to share in this. That's the point he's making. You know, we have an altar, we have a sacrifice, Jesus is our sacrifice, but we have access to that sacrifice through faith. And remember this whole passage here is about, this whole book is about remaining faithful. So he's saying if you're remaining faithful you have, asked, you, have, you have access to the true sacrifice. And he says the priests, they don't believe. So they may be offering sacrifice in a building that is devoid of the presence of the Lord, but they don't have access to this. They may have, they may have access to that sacrifice, but they don't have access to this sacrifice. He is our sacrifice, our altar, and the others have no right to share in it. But going out to Jesus meant two things. One, you needed to go outside of the camp, and the symbolism here for those he was writing to is, you need to go outside of the camp. What's the camp? Well, the Jews, they're the camp. The Jewish religion, that's the camp. You need to go outside the camp now if you're looking for purification. And secondly, you need to be ready to bear the reproach for being counted with Jesus. You know, remember, he's writing to them because they're suffering, right? Obstacles, they're suffering persecution because of their faith. So he, he, he keeps bringing those ideas back and saying, well, you know, you want to go back to Judaism, don't do that. You, you need to go outside the camp to find purification. And you need to be ready to suffer the obstacles and the trials of being faithful to Jesus. So going to Jesus outside the camp may bring a reproach, but the camp or the city or the sacrifice that the Jews were clinging to, it wasn't going to last anyways. Leaving the camp or city was the only way to find the true camp, the eternal city of God. And we know from history, right? This is written you know, several years before 70 AD, but we know in 70 AD the Romans come along, they destroy the city. There is no more temple, no more altar, no more priest, no more sacrifice. And so God knows this is coming and through this writer he's telling them, you know, don't go back to that. That's not going to last anyways. Verse 15 and 16. Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that give thanks to His name, and do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. So he finishes here by encouraging them to continue to worship God with a worship that is indeed valid, not the empty ritual of Judaism, but the very real exercise of Christian worship. Praise to God with gratitude, doing of good works, sharing and encouraging others to be faithful. And all of this done in the name of Christ, all of this was true worship and superior to the worship that the Jews were involved in at that time. He continues with his exhortations. He says, you need to love the brethren, practice sexual purity, learn to be content with what you have today, Maintain sound doctrine, Jesus the Son of God, you know, go outside the camp, and you need to obey your leaders. Verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable to you. And so he's, he's encouraged them uh, to remember former teachers um, warn them and expose the fallacy of some of the false doctrines that they face, and now he charges them to obey present teachers and present leaders. Remember the sandwich I said? Former teachers, some of the unsound doctrine they're having to deal with now, present teachers. So now he's talking to them about their present teachers. The leaders that they had obviously had the same attitude and teachings that their original leaders had. They were faithful men, and so he exhorts the church to obey them, follow their instructions, and submit to them, acknowledge their 
leadership. In another class, you know, I've said, submission is not slavery. Submission is something you offer willingly, right? Why? Because of your faith in God, because of your desire to obey the Lord in this matter. He tells them why this should be their attitude. First of all, because a leader's job is to watch over souls, not, not to be the boss. The shepherds are there to watch over souls. They're responsible for that. We need to cooperate. And then he says, this task should not be made more difficult than it already is by disobedient and rebellious members. Disobedient to the word, rebellious to the leadership. Don't make it difficult on them. They have a hard job, he says. You need to cooperate with them. This type of response would not profit them. There would be no growth and the Lord would punish them if they were not uh, in submission and in obedience to the present leaders that they, that they have. And so he finishes uh, in the last verses with some closing remarks. Uh, letters in the uh, Greek period of that time followed a kind of a set pattern at the beginning and at the end. The final words of an author follow this style of writing. There's a prayer and then final remarks followed by greetings from the author at the very end. So let's look at how he ends up. He begins with the prayer in verse 18 to 21, prays for himself and offers a prayer for his readers. And so in verse 18 and 19, he says, pray for us, for we are sure that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. And I urge you all the more to do this, so that I may be restored to you the sooner. 18 and 19 verses read. So he makes a prayer request at the beginning. He asks that they pray that he be restored to them soon. His conscience is clear and he's sure that what he has written is right. All he wants now is to be with them again in person, perhaps to share these things personally, perhaps to answer their questions like a, like a good teacher. Uh, he continues um, in verse 20 and 21, he says, Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so here he prays on their behalf. He starts with, okay, here's what you can pray for me, and now here's him praying for them. He prays that God will equip them not with everything, but with everything necessary to do His will. And they will know what God's will is in that it ultimately glorifies Christ. If what you're doing honors Christ, you're, you're doing the right thing. And he prays that God will give them what they need to glorify Christ in their lives. You don't need money to do that. You don't need strength. You don't need, you know, what you need to, to glorify Christ is faith and knowledge and courage. And then he makes some final remarks, verses 22 and 3. He says, um, but I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. Take notice that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom, if he comes soon, I will, um, I will see you. So he makes two personal remarks here, the only personal remarks he makes. One, he refers to his uh, letter as an exhortation, and he hopes that they'll receive it kindly, even though there are some pointed references in it, and there are, right? And then secondly, he mentions Timothy the evangelist with uh, uh, the hope of being reunited with him and soon. And he also mentions Timothy's imprisonment here, which is the only reference to that in the New Testament. And then, of course, the greeting at the very end, 24 and 25. He says, greet all of your leaders and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. And so he greets two separate groups, the leaders, the elders and the teachers, and the saints, the others in the church. And he mentions other brothers in Italy, typical Christian ending, conferring a request of divine blessing on the readers. So 
uh, the last section that we cover here, last couple of chapters, um, uh, the writer uh, answers the question, what does a, 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 a faithful and holy church do to glorify its Lord? You know, the, the beginning of the epistle tells us this is what a glorious Lord does to honor and glorify His church. This is who the glorious Jesus is and His glory you know, gives glory to the church. And then he finishes up with, and this is what the church that belongs to Christ, this is how they glorify Christ. So a faithful and holy church glorifies its Lord, how? Well, first it encourages the weak brethren to carry on and, 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 and not to fall back. Uh, a glorious church uh, honors Christ by avoiding conflict and immorality and bad example. A glorious church demonstrates, demonstrates love among the brethren, especially through the action of hospitality. A glorious church honors its Lord uh, by practicing sexual purity. A glorious church honors its Lord by relying on God and not on money for security. A glorious church honors its Lord by not following strange teachings and teachers, but rather submitting to its leaders who themselves submit to Christ and His word. And a glorious church honors its Lord by continually honoring God and offering to God acceptable worship through prayers of thanksgiving and good works in Jesus' name. And so after you know, such a, a long and complex study, what can I say to you? I mean, you know, what can I say uh, as a final word of exhortation, which you, the ones who have followed this lesson, this series here, here in our auditorium, those who may have watched this online or perhaps later on on a, on a recorded device, you know, online on our website or DVDs or whatever, you know, what, 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 what can I say to you as we finish this epistle? Well, I believe the Holy Spirit says it best. Um, right in the last chapter, he says in verse eight, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And so he was the Lord that saved them and the Lord that saved us, all of us. It, it was the Lord that held them up through their trials and to whom they looked for eternal salvation. And it is the Lord that we look to for help in our trials. And it is the same Lord that we look to for our eternal salvation. And it was the same Lord that you confessed and into whom you were baptized at the beginning of your Christian walk. Uh, the same one that uh, you pray to now and to whom you will uh, cry out for mercy when you lay on your deathbed. The relationship with God is the same back then as it is today. Technology and everything, yes, has changed, but that one-on-one that -on -one relationship with God, it's still based on the same things, the same values, faith and hope and, and holy living and loving relationships, the very, very same thing. And so it was the Lord to whom the author encouraged them to be faithful, and in the same way, through the teaching of this epistle, through modern technology where we can do it online to all kinds of people, it is the glorious Jesus that I also want you to remain faithful to. And I want you to do that because He was faithful to you yesterday, He is faithful to you today, and He will be faithful to you forever and ever into the future. And so I commend your spirits and I commend your souls to His love and His faith and His promises. So thank you very much for your attention for this entire series and I pray that God blesses you as you think about it and as you share it with other people.